Hello everybody and welcome back. Thank you very much for joining me. My name is Deborah Hatswell and you're listening to BBR Investigations. Every year I watch the seasonal patterns from the reports that come in and it enables me a unique insight into the habits and behaviours of the elusive British Big Book. Around harvest time each autumn, the signs in the woodlands died down and the investigators with ongoing interaction see the areas they're working emptying a sign. This happens every year for some reason, one I'm unsure of, but it happens like clockwork. Each spring, when the signs start to show again, we get a glimpse into their world, the world of cryptids and forest dwellers. Little footprints are found in snowy and wet, muddy, out-of-the-way places from early Jan, a little later if the weather's really bad. As the new food starts to show in the hedgerows and the woodlands, that attracts the critters, the deer and the rabbits and a whole host of others, and we begin to see strange glyphs being made. And if we really look at someone will set eyes on one of the forest beings and make a report. I must stress that contrary to popular belief, British Bigfoot sightings in the UK are very rare. Some years they are not seen at all, or they're seen much later in the summer months. When I share the sighting reports with you, they're often experiences that happened several years or sometimes decades ago. In reality, we get a few sightings from the long-term researchers that we call habituators each year. Not all of those sightings are made public. In those cases, sometimes the person I'm in touch with has had ongoing interactions since childhood. Or it's sometimes a case of doing the right research, enabling you to watch their habits and behaviours over a number of years, cluing you into their preferred habit. As for some folk, they just happen upon them whilst out going about their daily lives. They're suddenly confronted by a creature that's not supposed to exist and has they've had, you know, no prior knowledge of. I would imagine there are lots of cases that never get reported. Some witnesses probably talk themselves out of the sighting, you know, often chewing off the idea, questioning themselves about other possibilities, other options. There'll be others that may not know where or how to report what happened, or they feel they'll be ridiculed if they speak about it. In reality, the actual witness pool is very small, So as you can imagine, each spring, I sit and I wait for the clues to start to come in. This year, in the northwest of England, it's been really mild. We've had no real flooding or storms, but we have everywhere else in the country. For me, the dandelions, blackberry shoots and garlic are already up, and the woods are showing signs of life. Tonight, I'd like to share with you the first report of the year for 2024, and it happened within days of it being reported that it was reported to me. I've also included several other reports that have been the first reports to come into VBR during the end of winter to spring, during that quiet time. It helps to show how our different weather pattern affects the wildlife and in turn has an impact on the lives of our wood wolves, the forest folk, the wildmen, and what's now commonly referred to as the British Big Book. On the 3rd of March 2024, I received a report from a lady I know well and I've been in contact with for years who's had interactions with the monkey people uninvited since she was a young girl. The monkey people are how she refers to them, so I'll use the term during this report. The description's hard to pin down if you have no knowledge of cryptids. She once described them as bear-like, but also human, they didn't have tails but they move around and all four like dogs, but they whoop and howl in the woods. This situation is not something she enjoys or even wishes to happen. And thankfully, in the last few years, it's been quiet due to the many building works that are happening around the area for all of the new homes that are being made. And she was hoping that it'd stay like that. It's affected how she enjoys the area close to home. It's put her off spending time in nature with the dog. But things changed this spring as she saw one of those creatures again, not out in the fields on the greenbelt land. This time it appeared at her back boundary fence and for the first time the creature she saw looked female. I call this report the Woofs are on the move. A British Bigfoot spotted spring 2024. 
our witness said. Hi Deb, I'm checking in as I've had something happen on Saturday the 2nd of March. I had a really weird one. Not a frightening experience to begin with, because at first I was not sure what I was looking at. I didn't go and investigate in the dark for obvious reasons. Plus I wanted to wait for good light to make sure. I went out about 7am this morning so I could look at my back garden and analyse the event. I wanted to make sure I wasn't seeing patterns in the leaves of bushes etc. It was clear in daylight that this was not pareidolia. There was someone standing right on the other side of my back fence in the garden last night and I think it was one of those monkey people. But if it was, that's the closest I've ever come to my home. The first time I saw one of those creatures was when I was about eight years old. It was around 74, 75. I grew up in St. Helens and I'm still in the same area. I used to play on the old mining land that now makes up the Greenbelt land. And it was when I was doing this, I realised there's far more out there in the woodlands than anybody realises. I was out there one day and started to feel watched. So I started to look around me and I see, you know, what's changed, why I'm feeling like this. And about 60 yards away, I saw the back of what at the time I thought was a huge black bear. It looked like a huge grizzly bear without a tail. And it was bent over eating something. It stank too. I remember that smell. I did not know what it was, but I knew it was too big to be any kind of dog, as we had a dog at home that was half German Shepherd, half Labrador. This looked like an old black wolf without a tail. But the noises they make are whooping sounds like a monkey would make. Anyway, I ran as fast as I could all the way home. I told my mum what I saw and she went mad that I'd been over there alone. She said it was probably a big dog as we have no bears living well now in the UK. I know what I saw. Its coat was a bit like the colour of our dog. It's a weird shade of black. But when the sun catches it, it looks like it has a bit of red in there too. Now that I'm older, I think they've always been here. They seem to pass through the area in the early summer months. I tend to ignore them as best as I can, but I see them still. They never bothered me until I took some photos of them and this big one stood out at the bottom of our road in front of a streetlight. Its features were blacked out like a silhouette, but I could see the outline of him perfectly. And it was like a little, I know you see me. Well, I see you too. The locals are leaving food over there now, you know. They think it's baby foxes that are eating it. Somehow, I've managed to push them out of my mind, unless I get glimpses of them. Somehow, we've managed to coexist. I allowed them to do their thing, and they left me alone to do mine. I go out less when they're around. They have their areas, and my home is mine. Although I've seen them up on the railway embankment, I've only ever seen what I believe to be the males. This latest incident is different. This time, they were in what I would regard as my space. And I think it was a female that I saw. In fact, I'm certain it was a female. I should explain that was at the back door. I went for a cheeky smoke, standing next to the kitchen door. Naughty, I know, but it was bloody freezing and I didn't want to go into the garden itself. The neighbours to the rear of our house, whose garden backs onto our back garden, have these huge security lights with sensors. It's really overkill. But these lights not only light up their garden, but ours to a certain extent, and the other neighbours' gardens on either side of me. Anyway, because it's cold, and because it was quite late, instead of actually going into the garden, I stood on the step. In hindsight, I'm so glad I didn't go further out into the darkness. So I'm standing there smoking at the back door and my neighbour's lights started flashing on and off. I wasn't paying any attention at first. The house was in total darkness, so they were out because they're really noisy normally and the house is normally lit up with a light on in every room. Tonight it was pitch black and that's unusual. Anyway, I began looking towards the dividing fence, which is made up of concrete. The fence is tiered, so at some points at the fence it's 10 feet high. Then it drops down to around six feet plus, you know, counting the trellis on top. And then the next panel's about six foot four, and that's got no trellis on it. The garden from the neighbours did not measure up to ours, so we get a bit of a rear view of both of our neighbours. I don't know who built these higgledy-piggledy houses, but they need to do a better job. 
I have a garage that runs from near the back door and it goes towards the last panel on the back fence. The back door and windows are sort of on line with the last visible fence panel. So I'm there, a bit of smoke, when the neighbour's light suddenly starts turning on and off. I should say it was about half past one in the morning. I thought at first it was probably just a cat, a fox or something moving around close to one on the fence. We live right in the greenbelt land. And then the next thing that happened was all the garden lights came on at once and were staying on. So it was lit up like a stadium. As I'm looking towards the fence, I realise, oh my God, there could be someone in the neighbour's garden. So I took a much closer look. When my eyes adjusted, I noticed something moving in the garden, but it was tall enough to show above the fence. As I explained, our garden's tiered. There are three tiers going up to that fence. It's quite a drop on the other side. I was only thinking about a burglar or someone up to no good at that point. I was standing there, not sure what to do, trying to make out what it was. I've got the light shining behind it, but my son was in his bedroom with his lights on. I had the kitchen light on, so it wasn't totally a silhouette. At first, I thought they'd put something up against the fence. It was about seven and a half feet up. And I'm thinking, I'll get more trellis to hide whatever that bloody is. So I start looking at the shape, standing to the garden, or focusing my eyes. It's person-shaped. And I'm looking at the colour, which appeared to be like brownish, to be honest. And it looked womanish. It looked like she had hair going over the side. So I stepped a little bit further towards the beginning of the garage now. And I'm thinking, God, you want some bloody big ugly statue like that in the garden? And the wind blows and moves what I presume is a hair. Without thinking, I said, what the fuck out loud? And it heard me. As I spoke, it moved. And I mean moved. It was gone in a flash. I don't know who moved quicker, me or it. I couldn't see all its features, but I could see enough to know what it was. Like I said, I think it was about half past one in the morning at that time. I, tr- I tried not to think about it. I went indoors fast, but I did keep thinking about it all night. So as soon as I was up, I went into the garden to check I'd not mistaken anything for what I saw. But there was nothing on the fence panel or in any of the gardens I could have mixed it up with. It was definitely one of those creatures, the ones I'd seen on the railway line. It's funny what you realise with hindsight. I know our dog's been creating and acting up the last few nights, so I'm wondering now if that's connected. It may have been raiding their garden as to grow all sorts of stuff he can eat. I was wondering if the females or the younger ones looked different from the male's dead. If it didn't move, I wouldn't have seen it. It was amazing how long it stayed motionless for. I didn't think they went into people's gardens, but maybe food's a little scarce now, with us just coming out of winter and all the flooding down south. The foxes and squirrels visit our gardens for that reason, so why not them? I think I'll knock the evening dog walking on the head for a few weeks. I'm going to get some more lights, I think, and beep up the fence. I asked you if females look different, Deb, as its face was more feminine. Well, that's the impression I had. I thought at first it was made of wood and the lumps and the bumps were just the light and dark grain of that wood. Thinking back, it was probably the fair hair and the dim light that gave me that impression. Although it was big, it didn't appear bulky like the one that stood at the beginning of the fields after I took the photograph. I'm glad because that thing was ripped. This one, from what I could see with its head and shoulders, was muscular, but it wasn't ripped. I swear it had some kind of pattern on its cheeks, on its forehead and its chin, almost like a camouflage, or possibly even scars on its face. The hair's coarse and definitely not fur, it's a kind of cinnamon colour, not dark brown like the males I've seen. I don't know how to explain it, and as you know, they freak me out sometimes. I wish all this would just go away. I found my doubt my neighbours are away on holiday, so I'm hoping this won't happen once they're back home. But I'll keep you updated if anything happens. The area is really rural, lots of farms and fields, plenty of woodlands and water sources that run west to the coast. Or you can come inland, heading in my direction, using that mining land the whole way. 
In fact, in every direction, there's plenty of green corridors that skirt small towns and the little villages that we have. It's another area that can be reached from Winter Hill. And it has all the things we look for when looking for a possible habituation area. As I said earlier, it's been really mild here. We haven't had much of a winter while the rest of the country has been uninundated with flooding and snowstorms. We're high up, we're at a high elevation. And I believe that this has an effect on where they are in conjunction with the bad weather. There is a case on the same mining land that I've been involved with since the witness contacted me about 18 months ago after seeing strange signs pop up in the woods where he lives and saw what he described as a wild human. One incident sparked some worry for us when Dave, the witness, and his wife were visiting friends for the day. Their daughter, who was a teenager, rang them in a very distressed state after a frightening experience at home. It started with strange banging on the walls of the house and then pounding on the door. Dave advised his daughter, while still on the phone, to peep out the bedroom window and see who was ransoning on the door. And when she looked, nobody was there. This case is an ongoing case, and I will be recording an entire interview with David about the whole experiences. Now, I'd like to add some of the cases that mention the first creatures seen for that year. As previously stated, I believe our weather patterns throw a spanner into the work sometimes, and the forest dwellers find themselves unexpectedly on the move because of this. When this happens, sometimes we're lucky enough to see them when they're caught out. In other cases, our freak weather patterns help them out. In areas of flooding, the low-lying areas are often fields. When the river floods, it fills those fields with water. And when it recedes, those floods remain in the fields with lots of misplaced fish that can be in under several inches of water. It makes them easier to catch. Humans worldwide take advantage of this and they make a special basket run at the field and scoop up the fish so why wouldn't a 300 pound flesh and blood cryptid do the same flooding in some areas means the food sources are not available and the forest folk have to go further and further afield to find these resources if the weather is unusually hot the lack of water can bring them out into the open in the same way severe cold brings them closer to sheltered areas like farms barns outbuildings cave systems and all manner of shelters and we sometimes see signs of this as well our next two cases i believe would not have happened if it wasn't for the severe weather experienced at the beginning of 2021 this report took place on the 2nd of february 2021 at 9:51 a.m in the morning remember that time and that day in this case, the witness said, I've had a history of investigating a series of woodlands about the villages nearby where I live in Staffordshire. I've seen some amazing tree breaks, 8, 12 feet off the ground, arched over trees, X structures, you know, suspended young trees and tangled masses of like branches, almost like a kaplunk. I've also discovered a variety of indistinct footprints, two sizes, some are 8 inches and some are 12 inches long. The day this happened was no different to any other. I intended to have um, another few hours exploring the local woodland. I'd just parked my car in a lay-by, standing outside, in the process of putting my walking boots on. My attention is drawn to a small area of woodland about 300 metres away. I'm startled to see the head, an upper body, and the legs down to the knees of what looked like a large hairy man. He or she was in the process of watching a group of pheasants in an adjacent field and they were attracted to that field because the farmer had dumped loads of stale silage and animal waste there. So as I'm watching the hairy man, it turned to its right from a standing position, took three or four long strides with its arms swinging, followed an arc before entering a dense thicket of holly. He strode between two large trees, his... Maybe her lower legs were hidden behind the piles of silage and the animal waste. The hairy man had a great bulk to his or her body, had not much of a neck, good sized head. His facial features were indistinct due to the distance. He had long muscular arms, the hands reaching to the knees. The stride was smooth, 
the creature's back was slightly sloping forwards. There was no rise and fall of the body as it moved. The colour of the hairy body was, say, a mid-mousy brown, and numerous patches of beige and kind of honey-coloured hair about the head and shoulders and parts of the back. It had kind of a mottled appearance. The paler areas were indeed hair, it seems, and not bald areas. Had it not been for the pale colour of the form and its movement, I may not have noticed that. The pale colour of this being stood out markably against the dark green holly trees, and that's where it entered. Had the body on this thing been black or brown, I wouldn't have seen it. I wouldn't have noticed it at all. Needless to say, I waited till it had gone, and then I rushed to the area of woodland, with my camera, my binoculars in hand, and between the silage waste and the woodland was a barbed wire fence. The posts are probably four feet in height. The hairy figure stood and moved behind that fence, and from the fence post height, the estimated height of the creature would put it about seven feet tall. The weather that year was really bad in the south of England, but in the Midlands and the northern areas, it had been much milder. The pheasants, I think, in the clue here, they were clustered together, foraging, and I think the creature was taking advantage of that situation. I think if he'd not been caught off guard by the investigator, He'd have taken one, you know, or possibly more of the birds. In fact, I don't think it would have gone far to conceal itself. When the researcher walked back in there, he was taking a bit of a risk. I have no doubt those pheasants were on the menu. And as soon as the human had left, that creature would have re-emerged. The farmer probably dumps his silage there years in, years out, and has done, going back generations. And the creature would be in knowledge of that information. Like bears, an early man, they have a huge food map remembered that's passed down from generation to generation as we move in land or out to the coast. When we foraged and lived in small tribes, each foodstuff would be learned until you knew it inside out. You'd know what season it emerged and the best times to pick or catch it. New forage brings new protein as the animals who eat the new growth come into the area. Following the new food across the country is also following the deer and the critters as they move too. This is the reason deer hold back their embryos until good weather's due. It's why many of our natural species mate or give birth at this time of year. It is the time of new growth. Milder weather and the start of a bountiful larder if you know where to find it. The fields and hedgerows start to bloom. Small fish and fry fill our rivers and ponds. Frogs, squirrels, birds mate with a vengeance, knowing warm weather and good times are on the way. Early humans knew this, and I believe the British Bigfoot does. Two, they know every food and medicine source that's out there. Their only worries are food, water and shelter and keeping away from us. I believe in 2016, two of these creatures were caught out doing just that on a lonely road in Scotland in the first few weeks of the spring. The man who made the report made it to Charmaine Fraser, who's researched the Scottish wild man after an experience of her own when she was a child, and she kindly allowed me to add that to the BBR case files. The witness said, I'd like to report an incident that happened to me in Argyll, Scotland, which is one of my favourite places to be. This happened when I was driving down one of the single track roads between Taynull and Delawitch. There's a small track that runs along the side of Loch R. There are miles and miles of forestry tracks that you can walk along. It's a good place to be if you want solitude, be away from the hustle and bustle. You can walk for hours without bumping into anyone. There are tracks and trails crisscrossing the area. It's a short walk from Loch T, Loch R. There's multiple places to go off track and just enjoy your time in nature. Although I do question if I'm safe walking alone after seeing what I can only describe as a hunting party of two out there on the road that night. Something I'll never forget. It happened around 1am in March 2016. I was driving back from a friend's house after an evening of visiting. I was sober, good spirit. I was alone in the car. And at this point, I was driving through the older parts of the forest. I noticed a movement, luckily, as I was driving. Without warning, suddenly, from my left-hand side, I was startled by a deer running out into and across the road. 
the day I was watching was running as fast as it could. It was in flight. It was so fast, I didn't have time to think about what was chasing it. it I looked back to see what had spooked the day, and I saw that it was being followed by a large man-like creature. He was wild looking, really tall and really hairy, and he was running. He was moving at a fast pace. You know, it, he took one long stride across the road in front of my car. Without thinking, I slammed on the brakes and stopped. My eyes were fixed on the running man. You see, this thing was, as soon as I hit the brakes and turned to look where the wild man and the deer had come out of the trees, up to my left, I saw what looked like another one. This figure was smaller, younger, not so big muscled, but a wild man type thing all the same. It wasn't looking at me, but looking towards where the bigger wild man had run into the trees. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. And to this day, I still question what I saw that night. I did get a good look at both of them. The moon was out. It was clear and crisp. It's not like I could have mistaken them for something else. They looked exactly what they were. Two wild men hunting. The first one that crossed over the road after the day was at height of, I would guess, eight feet tall. He had hair all over his body and he was naked. It was hard to tell the colour exactly at night, but it was dark coloured hair, just like the smaller one. It wasn't a huge road, but even so, its stride must have been at least six feet to cover the distance in one leap like that. The way it moved was startling to me. It was fluid and fast. The one on the hill looked smaller and younger, and the eyes were strange. The smaller one looked back at me with kind of reflecting or glowing eyes like a dog's in the dark. The smaller, wild one did not follow the larger man, but it backed into the darkness of the trees, and I started to drive off, as it gave me quite a fright. In most of the cases we have heard so far, the creature is described as moving at great speed. They're all hair-covered. They resemble something between a hairy human or a human-animal cross of some kind. I wonder if we would just be as fit and as healthy if we live the life that they live. In 98% of the cases that come in, they mention a male creature or figure of some kind. Females and juvenile sightings are incredibly rare, but they do happen. This would suggest to me a breeding pattern of some kind. Those reports are often taken in these early months of the year. In the Peak District, one man saw a huge male when the area was in flood. Mm. It was, um, at the time, I think the creature was moving between one quarry area and another, and that happened on Robin Hood Lane. And then we have the report from the Ouse. You remember earlier when I said, remember that day and that time, our witness saw something in Staffordshire on the 2nd of the 2nd, 2021, at 10 to 9, 10 to 10 in the morning. In this case, the day before, in Bedfordshire, where the flooding was, a man saw a woose fishing in the water. At the time this experience took place, it was 24 hours between this report and the one from Staffordshire. It was in the first few weeks of Feb. The river ooze had burst its banks and it flooded the low-lying areas for many miles around. The river ooze has a variety of fish species, from trout, carp, barbel, perch, pike, grayling, bullets, stone loach, tench, along with your more common, you know, UK rivers. The tidal section of the river is holds bass, grey mullet, twape, sea trout and flounder. So it's a pretty well stocked larder. The area had been hit by storm after storm and the spring growth was late that year. When the ooze banks broke, lots of those fish stocks flooded the fields along with the floodwaters. As the rivers recede and the floods lessen, Lots of fish end up trapped in the fields and low-lying ponds. I think the creature seen by our witness has taken advantage of this plentiful bounty, as would any bird, box, any meat-eating scavengers, along with us, early humans way back in time, when we were living in the same circumstances, when we lived wild and free. It's incredibly hard finding food resources, so an easy meal is attractive to all living things. 
Our witness was driving to work when he saw me in Bedfordshire, when he saw a strange figure that stood out to him as unusual as he turned a bend in the road. The figure seemed to be looking into the water as it was looking for something. He was so startled by what he saw, he waited until the end of his shift and went back in better light to see if he was mistaken. Steve wanted to debunk what he saw that morning, but the return visit did not show anything that Steve could have confused with the figure he'd seen earlier in the day. He said, I went back as soon as I finished work and made the video for you to share where I'd seen this figure. I'm driving to work and as I'm moving along the route, I could see the river. I kept getting glimpses of something in the water in the flooded field. This thing came from behind a hedgerow in the second field and was wading through there. It's really long hair. Even at the cup area of its wrists, you know, its arms, it was easy to see. It had long hair. And you could see the shape of it as it moved. It wasn't human. It reminded me of the typical description of an early wood mouse. The hair went over its hands and hung down. It was a charcoal grey colour, and it was silhouetted against the water. Looking at it now, I'm back here, I can see there's nothing I could have mistaken this thing for. He wasn't standing still to not be seen. So I couldn't have possibly confused a telegraph pole or a tree for this thing. It was a living thing and it was wading through the water and I could see it clearly. There's nothing that big out here and it was big. It came through the water looking down every now and again. I saw it put its hand over the water as if it was shading it, you know, looking in for something. I slowed right down that morning to about... 35 mile per hour and there were no other vehicles around that early so there's no cars in front and behind me I got a really good clear look at it I formed the impression it was fishing you could see the long hair on its face as it leant forwards to look into the water it was a thick bodied thing and it must have been at least 8 feet tall and standing here now I think it was even taller it was also really thick and bulky I think this report is incredibly important as it shows the creature as it goes about its daily habits. It's looking in the water for something. That's what's drawn it out into the open. At this time of year, the fields, woods and hedgerows are pretty barren in some places. And it's the lean time before they burst into life. Squirrels and birds have depleted their caches and everything is on the move looking to feed or to mate. In the first case tonight, from the St. Helens area, the witness herself said she felt a female creature had visited the garden in search of food. It was around 1.30am in a little mining village, small towns, most folk are in bed. And anyone who's not is probably travelling by a car and you'll hear them coming for a while, enabling a quick escape. We leave these forest dwellers no choice in becoming our closest neighbours. In fact, we encroach on the areas they call home daily. As more and more park and rides are built along with huge retail parks and thousands of houses, schools, shops and health services needed to facilitate all the staff and the families. Our greenbelt land is becoming smaller and smaller, filled with tiny box houses with no provisions for wildlife. Many of them are flagged or even worse covered in astroturf. Where are they supposed to go in times of need? Each year, as they move around, they will have to adapt and overcome the many obstacles we put in their place. Our small birds, bats and native squirrels are being forced into smaller and smaller areas and the lack of hedgerows to nest in, the bird populations are dwindling. I am convinced this is why I saw the creature that day at Beulil. It was warm that day. You could smell the scents from the foods and the herbs coming from the sensory garden. I think we were in the wrong place at the wrong time. We disturbed what could have been his seasonal food source. When I went back in 2015 with the Finding Bigfoot film crew, they commented on just how many large squirrels and birds were in the dark and were actually there at the park and just how many natural food sources there were after I pointed them all out. There used to be a huge stock lake, it's long gone now, but it would have been an old mining shaft which was left to nature, and it had plenty of fish and bird habitat. The lady who saw the creature, the same as me, saw him two years later, it was in 84, 
but it was much earlier in the year for her. It was the middle of January, and the weather was cold that year. Is this why he was back there? You know, were resources scarce that year? I don't know. He was seen again in snowy conditions not too long ago. So I can hazard a guess, the park is, or was, a vital place for him still. Who knows? Maybe he's still out there, tucked away somewhere. If not him, then some of his kind. But that old mansion's been turned into apartments, and they're going to put a park car park on the golf course and build houses in the park. I think he'll have to move, which has just filled me with absolute sadness. You only need to move a mile or two, you know, because then it'd hit the Irwell River Basin. It's a wildlife river course that flows through some of the wilder places in the area where I live. From there, he could go anywhere. And no doubt someone will see him again one day. And I'll be really grateful if that's not me. Thank you for joining me today, and I hope you'll join me for future episodes. I release content like this every week, and I'm sure I'll cover a topic you enjoy, so don't miss out. Hit that follow or like button. Please check out my YouTube and Patreon memberships for early or exclusive content. And you can find the link to them and my social media and donation sites in one handy link tree below. BBR is not funded, so any donation, no matter how small, is highly appreciated. So I will bid you adieu and I will be back at the same time, the same day, with more from the BBR case files.